So, going over the assignment number three, which presumably you've emailed to Gislamp by now. Um, this one was intended to be a little tougher, sort of get you guys. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I mean, so far from the grading I saw from Gislamp, I think you guys did fairly well. So. Um, so, the first one, compute the proportion of canceled flights per month and plot these with points and lines. So we're dealing with the flights data set from NYC Flights. And I explicitly say you can use the presence of an NA in the arrival delay column as indicative of a canceled flight. So we're gonna, I'm going to use the piping syntax here. So we start with the flights data set. And well, of course, we start by loading up the NYC flights, dplyr, and ggplot. Um, so we start with the flights data set. We pipe that to call the group by because eventually we want to do some computations um, dealing with month. Um, well, actually, the, we do group by month. And immediately we're doing a summarize. So by doing the group by first, it will um, tell summarize to do whatever computation we've told it to do for each chunk of the data where a chunk is specified for each month. So what do we ask? So we do the group by and then pipe that to summarize. What are we asking summarize to do for each month? It's going to create a new column called P. And in P, it's going to put the result of this computation over here. So, all right, start on the innermost thing, arrival delay. That's the thing where if there's an NA in that, that means that the um, flight was canceled. So we want to ask, are the values for each value in this column, is it an NA or not? So to do that, we use the is.na function. Um, if you might have had equals NA, or an attempt to do that. Um, that actually kind of works because, um, or no, actually for this example it won't. Down here it kind of works, but for this example it wouldn't have worked. It would have yielded an NA for this thing. Um, so you want to use is.na to ask, is, are the, for each of the values in this column, arrival delay, um, is it an NA or not? So that yields another sort of list of ones and zeros. So for every um, uh, every entry that is an NA, there's a one there, true. And for every entry that's not NA, it's going to be a zero, false. So when you have a column of ones and zeros, you can get the proportion by just getting the mean of that column. You can get the proportion of ones by taking the mean of that column. Um, so that's why I use this. So mean is dot na arrival delay yields uh, a value that represents the proportion of um, NAs in that column. So the proportion of canceled flights in that column. Again, this is split by month. So summarize is going to spit out a data frame with a column called month and a column called p, and we're going to pipe that straight to ggplot. So again, ggplot will take as its data argument um, whatever we've piped to it. So we now just have to specify the mapping. So we want on the x-axis month and on the y-axis this thing we just computed, p. And having sort of specified the general mapping in this initial call to ggplot, we can then add the two geoms that I asked for, which is a point and a line. No, you don't need to. As long if it's the common mapping to all the geoms that are going to be added together, you can just put that common mapping right in the call to ggplot rather than repeating it for each of the geoms. A little bit extra time saver there. So I'm going to run that and goes through and produces wiggly plot. So if you happen to be interested in whether there's sort of variability across the months. Um, in the proportion canceled flights, that would be a nice visualization for you. So the next question, let me copy it from over here. 
So filter out the cancel flights, then compute the variance of each plane's flight speed and plot these as a histogram. Do I have? Oh, yeah. Remember tail num, the tail num column encodes uh, the individual plane identities. All right, so again, I start with the flights data set. Um, I know I want to filter out the, whoop, sorry. I didn't want to filter out those uh, cancel flights. So in the same way that I used is.na arrival delay to sort of label those canceled flights, label flights as either canceled or not, um, I'm going to use that again in my call to filter. Filter wants sort of a logical here, a logical selector that will, um, all those values are true, it's going to keep. So is.na returns true when it was canceled. So I want to reverse that. So I use the exclamation mark. So exclamation means not. So not canceled. So this little bit would yield sort of true would be canceled and this would be not canceled. So having filtered the data, I then group by tail num. Notice I could have grouped by tail num and then filtered. The order of that typically doesn't matter. As long as you do your, and I even could have grouped after this next step, mutate. Um, as long as you group before your summarize, it's fine. Um, I just happened to put it here. So I grouped by tail num, which is the plane, the column that encodes sort of the individual plane identities. And I piped that to mutate, which is just creating a new column. Um, there was a distance column and an airtime column. So the ratio of those is your speed. So that computes for every flight, the speed. And then what I want to do is for each individual plane, compute the variance of the speed, variance of the flights for that particular plane. Um, if you notice I've got this here, we don't need that yet. I'm going to comment that out. That's all uncomment to show you the answer to number three. So, and additionally, you'll see there's this commented section. Um, so again, summarize is going to create a new column called V. It's still going to have whatever columns we've done the group by. So we'll have summarize is, summarize is going to spit out a new data set that has a column called tail num and a column called v. Um, and we can just pipe that straight to ggplot. Um, since we're doing a histogram, we want to put and we want to do a histogram of the values in that v column. Um, we're just saying put that v, whatever's in that v column on the x-axis, and then add the histogram geom. I'll run this little bit. Prove it works. Is there sort of any questions? Like, should I go back over any part of that sort of stage? Yeah. I have a question about the mutate. Um, in class, you said the speed is going to be distance divided by airtime times 60. Sure, that's yeah. if you wanted it. So the multiply by 60 is just changing the units from like minutes to seconds or I, doesn't matter. Okay. So you just want to it doesn't matter. If you put times 60, that's perfectly fine, too. Yeah. Where would you put it? Well, filter. So you're thinking instead of that, we'd say na.rm equals true. Um, Filter doesn't have any argument called na.rm. So like error delay and then... Uh, oh, okay, okay. So if you thought equals... Whoops, sorry. If you did that, some people did that, um, and that actually works, unfortunately. Um, but only because filter tosses na's as well as falses. So let me explain. When you do this test, you could even do it as equals equals NA without the quotes. Um, I found it more um, common for people to use the quotes though. 
um, the same thing happens. So what, it, what filter will do, will do is it will look at the arrival delay column. It will ask, is the thing on the inside of the arrival delay column precisely equal to the string that's over here? Um, none of the values in this column are strings. Some are numbers, some are NA. So in theory, this is all going to turn out to be falses. So that would keep none of the, um, oh, actually people had like not equal to, sorry, that's what they would have. So in theory, this would, because none of the entries in this column that's mostly numbers, some NAs, um, do, are not strings, so they won't match this string over here, you'd come up with all trues, except that for those comparisons, for those entries where there's actually an NA on, um, in the arrival delay column, any comparison that involves an NA on either side yields an NA. So you're going to have true for all the numbers. This will yield true for all the numbers in this column, and it will yield NA for all the NAs in this column. And filter will automatically toss any falses or NAs. So it kind of works, unfortunately. Um, I say unfortunately because it's not technically correct. Um, it would be, it's, yeah, much clearer uh, to do it this way and not rely on filter having that sort of secondary behavior of not only tossing falses, but also tossing um, NAs. But you wouldn't be penalized if you had. If you did, sorry? For numbers, uh, you have another database, mm -hmm. and then in this column, there yep. are numbers and blank. No. Ah, well, that would be associated with uh, reading in the data, um, which we'll talk about. Um, if you have a data set that um, has like an empty, uh, an empty blank, um, there's a way to tell R as it's reading in the data to fill that with an NA. So that actually, that's the default behavior. In fact, with R, if it sees a blank field, it'll put an NA there. So yeah, that wouldn't ha it wouldn't crop up and or cause any troubles for this Even type. Of mix between printing, subjects, and printing. Yeah, yeah, and we'll get into that in today's lecture. In fact, okay. Any other questions? Yeah. I'm a little bit confused about the pipe. Can you talk about the pipe? Sure. Yeah. So I uh, talked a little bit about the pipe um, last week. The general idea is that um, I could be uh, creating, so um, I could say flights2 equals filter uh, dot data equals flights, and then uh, is dot na, and in fact, if I remember, it's supposed to be not, so I remember to put that back in. So that creates flights2, and then I'd to do the next one, I'd say flights, call it uh, flights three equals group by, um, and then say dot data equals flights two, and tail num, and flights four equals mutate dot data equals flights. Three um, and speed equals distance divided by air time. So that gets us to let's just say right there. Um, I can you can do it this way where you are calling the function by giving it a sort of an, a um, value to this named argument data and storing the result of this function into a new variable and then moving on to the next one using this one as the value of this named argument data and storing the result of all this into a new variable but that starts like what if I often I find myself I'll mistype things and whatever um, you also have to sort of come up with nice names for variables and things um, the alternative is that um, all the dplyr functions automatically, they know about this thing called a pipe, whereby 
if it sees a pipe in front of it, it assumes that the thing the pipe is passing to it is a data set that we want to use as the value for the first argument. And all of these functions spit out a data set. So when you chain two together, that means take the flights data set, pipe it to filter. So filter will use the flights data set as its value for this first argument. Filter will spit out a data set into the next pipe. So group by will see a data set coming out of its pipe, the pipe right before it, and use that as the dot data, as the value supplied to its dot data argument, and so on. So you can achieve the same, same thing with the two different methods. Um, I at first taught you guys how to do it this way because it's, um, uh, well, to focus on what the actual functions are doing. But when you're actually writing code and doing analyses, it makes things much more straightforward if you just do the, do the piping. You have to remember less. You don't have to remember, or you don't have to make up uh, names for the, each of the intermediary objects that you're never really gonna use again anyway. Um, and you don't have to remember those names and not screw up typing them. Uh, so yeah, that's why we use the pipe. Does that make sense? Pipe. Um, it comes, so the word pipe actually comes from sort of uh, the Unix operating system. Um, it's actually, usually it's the character, uh, it's the straight up character right above uh, return. Um, it's this, it's like the straight line. Um, it, it just means something that's going to be a conduit, something to pass um, the output of one function as the input of another function. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so to achieve this plot, we filter, group, mutate, summarize, and plot. Um, but we get this strange sort of warning message here. Uh, removed 168 rows containing non-finite values. So, um, and I asked, why does that happen? So if I actually, one thing we can do is to, um, well, yes. So one, I think I actually even suggested you might want to count the number of entries. Let's see. Uh, hint, in your call to summarize, compute a count as well as a variance and look at the resulting data sorted by that count. Okay, so I had this commented out before. Presumably when you're doing it the first time, you wouldn't have thought to include a count. This time I'm going to do it. Again, we've filtered the data so there's no cancel fights. We've grouped by tail num. Uh, we've mutated so that there's this um, extra column called speed. So now in summarize for each sort of individual plane, we're computing the variance of the speed of all the flights that it's had. And this n will just count for that plane how many flights were involved, how many flights it took. Um, so if we actually, so that's what the n function does. I named the column n um, just for convenience. Could have called it count or something like that, num flights. So let's comment out these. I suggested in the question that you produce this extra thing and you then resort the column by that value. So again, the count. Arrange again. Summarize is going to spit out a data frame. Arrange is going to accept that data frame and resort it according to whatever columns I give it here. So there's going to be an n column in this data frame, and I'm going to resort it. And after I do the arrange, I actually use the right hand arrow assignment. Um, this is the one case where I realized it actually can be useful because you can see the flow of the data kind of coming in, getting filtered, and then finally getting put into this thing that I'm going to call f. So I created this new thing called f, and I put into it the result of this whole sort of chain of operations, and I just print f. And what we get, and I'll hide the plot, it's a tibble with the... Um, 
three columns, tail num, V, and N, 4,037 uh, entries. So that's all the different flight numbers. Oh, question? Sorry. Yep, you could print, type into prints. Let's actually, uh, I'm not sure. Let's try it. Um, I wonder, I don't know if, see all the dplyr functions and ggplot are smart in that they look for a pipe for its input. Oh, well, I guess print has been, I bet you when you load up dplyr, it um, modifies print to be, pipe um, aware. So, all right, so we've got three columns, variance n and tail num, tail num is the each individual, individual plane, v is the variance computed for all of that plane's uh, flight speed, or plane's flight's speeds, and then n is the number of flights that were involved in for that plane. So, I immediate, if I sort by n, which is what we've done here with this arrange, um, we see the sort of smallest values of n first because it's ascending order by default. So the smallest values of n is 1, so you wouldn't have any flights logged in the um, database if the, flight, if the plane didn't have any flights. So um, if there was at least one flight for a plane, it's in the database. Um, and the v is 0, so why, or sorry, na. So why would it have a variance of NA. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, one person. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You So if you actually look at the formula for variance, there's an N minus 1 at the bottom. So that would be divide by 0. So you can't, if you have just a single number, there's no variability. You can't compute variance. So um, that's what happens there. Oh. In terms of the Well, so summarize will take any function that sort of reduces the data in a way. Var wants you to give it like the name of a column to reduce. N automatically assumes you just want to count the number of rows. Uh, so it doesn't need a, you to give it a column to count. It just knows. So counting the number of rows for each uh, tail number. Yeah. So for each plane, how many flights does it have in the database? And some flights, some planes just had one flight in the database. So can't compute a variance on them, so you've got NAs again. I don't think N accepts any uh, N. No, there's no, it's a function that does not accept any arguments, so you can't give it anything. Ah, you don't see that 168 did. Um, you see that at least there's scenarios where um, the you get an NA when there's one, but we can actually explicitly look at this question. So let's actually confirm that the... I'll put this back to the way it was. Let's confirm that if our hypothesis is correct that um, these NAs are the reason why we got that warning message, 168, then we should have precisely 168 NAs in this data set. So we can say F is a new sort of object. Pipe that into summarize, maybe? Well, we, we could filter and then look how many rows are left or we can filter and keep the NAs and look how many uh, rows are there. Um, but Or we could just summarize and just literally get a count. So again, summarize, we'll take this new data set F and we just really want to do, um, well, what do we want to do? Uh, I guess here where is where we could do a um, count, NA, count, I'll call it, some 
is dot n a b. So up above, when we wanted to get the proportion of n a's, we use the mean. If we just want to count of the n a's, we can do sum. And if we look there, there's 168 NAs. <laughs> uh, well, this the tools I'm trying to show you here is if you get like a data set that is either unknown to you or known, but you know that you need to do some like transformations to the data. And these are the sort of go-to tools that um, you should, I guess, this is the simplest way to achieve various transformations. These, I wanted to give you some general tools to achieve those sort of uh, ends. Um, it's also useful if you want to do sort of data exploration, um, which we're not going to do really in this class. Um, the R for data science does go into a little bit more of the um, explorative sort of data, uh, well, data visualization and um, uh, what is it called? Not confirmatory, um, but exploratory uh, statistics. Um, we're going to be doing the more confirmatory stuff. Um, uh, if you happened when you eventually get to your, um, well, either your next courses or your whatever consulting jobs you might get into, um, you need to do some data manipulation. These are the tools that I wanted you to have in your belt. It's entirely possible that for the assign for the um, not assignment but um, paper, you'll find a data set that's ready to go. You just have sort of your predictor variables all set up, and you can just easily get them um, into the next tool that I'll be teaching you, which is um, dealing with Bayesian data analysis. And, uh, such. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Had a question. So all I was doing there um, is the equivalent to taking the output of a range and putting it into a new object that I'll just arbitrarily call F. So I was just creating a name for an object that I could type quickly so, so I could look at it. Um, yeah, I could have put F equals that up there. Um, and that would, should it be clear at the outset that I'm going to be doing some set of transformations and storing the result into this thing called F? Um, it's up to you. No clear, I, I don't yet have a clear opinion on where to put the assignment when you're doing these chains. My old workflow where I didn't have piping and chaining, I was always doing the equals, so you have the assignment up front. Um, now that I sort of have uh, come over to the uh, pipe side, I'm uh, I am, am as yet ambivalent. All right, so um, I want to uh, give you a little bit of exposure to reading in data. Um, Hopefully, the data sets that you'll be dealing with are sufficiently clean that reading in data won't be too much of a headache. I'll show you, though, some scenarios where you can have some headaches um, and where sort of generally what you do to solve those. Um, did I see a question almost happen? Yes. Uh, actually, I was wondering, is there any source from which we practice such questions? Well, the, yeah, I, I wish the R for data set, so this piping sort of method is a little bit new. Um, there's starting to be some manuals that um, are coming out, or textbooks that uh, have these as examples. Um, I mean, go, f go through the R for data science because they certainly have a lot more examples of um, using the piping than uh, we've sort of covered. Um, I'll look around for any more deep flyer um, sort of tutorials and things like that. Um, yeah. So, okay, reading in data. So I'm going to go ahead and close this RStudio. 
and I'll bring up my file browser. I'm still recording, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, and I want to go to this, and then, okay. So, let's imagine, I don't even need this. Let's imagine I have somewhere on my computer a project associated with my, um, my or just some project that has some data that I want to do some data analysis with. A general sort of uh, principle of organization that I have is that I'll have a folder associated with that project. Let's call it ant1. And inside that folder, which I'll call the parent folder, um, there's two children folders. Uh, inside the data folder is a bunch of data. This would be a particular sort of data set where sometimes you have a data set where you just have a single data file and that's really nice because you just do things all at once, you read in one file. Sometimes you have many data files, in which case it makes sense to have a whole separate folder for the data. Um, if you just had like one file for the data, then I would just have a single sort of, I wouldn't have two folders, one for analysis, one for data, I just put the data and the analysis files all together. Here is an example where I do have multiple um, files. In the analysis folder, um, I'm just going to actually delete that one. Uh, I have an R script that uh, I've named sort of named it reading examples because I was this is examples of reading and data for you guys. Um, so a somewhat informatively named um, R script for doing the analysis on that data. If you actually didn't have um, if you're starting sort of a fresh, uh, you can just copy like an R script from one of your other projects into this folder um, or uh, create a text file and then rename it .r. Um, regardless, the reason why I like to start with an R file in this folder is because when R is closed and R Studio is closed, if I open up R in R Studio, or if I double click on this in either Windows or Mac, um, it will open up that file, that script, but critically, it will also set the working directory to be looking at the location of this script. That saves me a little bit of hassle in that if I weren't to do that, uh, let me, I don't know, I'll go home and I'll close this file. So let's pretend that I hadn't opened that and actually I'll say, if I'd, in fact, I'll close this and I'll just open up our studio. So opening up our studio without having clicked on a button or on a file. Um, it navigates to a default location and then I'd have to, uh, I could open it now, but it still is looking, the console, the working directory is still the default location. So I'd have to go and uh, there's a button to say, um, it's not there, uh, session set working directory to source file location. So whatever source file you have as your sort of primary one, it would set it, set the working directory there. But then I'd need to tell my files area to go there too. So I'd say, go to working directory and finally it would come up. So it's a lot easier to sort of, again, start with our studio closed and just be able to double click that and it opens up, sets the working directory in the console, sets the working directory to look at, or sets the file pane to look at the working directory here, and you're all set up to start doing things. Um, so a couple packages that you'll want to install uh, for this. Um, you don't have these files, so you don't worry about doing it right here now in class. Um, but uh, our, is the per um, package, um, P-U-R-R-R, um, and the reader package. The reader package will be used for um, reading in files and the one by one, and the per package is used to read in lots of files all at once. dplyr, of course, is uh, one, actually in this script we don't use it, so it's not necessary. And tibble, you, reader automatically spits out tibbles, so actually I don't think you need this. 
loaded in explicitly. It will be script loaded in in the background when you load in Reader. In any event, so actually, let me even just delete those. So I have them installed, so I don't need to run these two lines. I'll run these two. And all right, so to read in one file, there's a number of different sort of different reading functions that Reader provides. They usually start with read underscore. Some of the default functions that R provides without having Reader available um, start with read dot. So you'll be able to discriminate between the built-in R stuff versus the extra Reader stuff by the it being read dot for base R, read underscore is Reader. Reader is much more much smarter and than the base R, um, hence why I suggest you use it. Um, in fact, if you um, uh, well, actually, I'll, I'll talk about one example, and then we will uh, go back and um, yeah, I'll yeah, I'll talk about this one example, and then well, I guess I'll try to remember to elaborate on a simpler way of doing things. So I'm going to read in one file. I happen to know that the file is a, um, actually I'll do the CSV one. Okay. So if I look at my files area, I can actually navigate to the other directories. So this dot dot means go up one. So I'm in the child, the analysis folder, I can go up one and now I'm in the ant I or ant one folder. Um, I can go down into the data folder and I'll see all my different files. Um, there's a CSV file. If you notice the little icon in the um, RStudio interface, that means that you can actually click that file and um, it will... Uh, oh, I thought it brought up a view of that file. I guess it doesn't. You can click any of these files and it will, if you say view file, and it will just show the raw text that's in the file. Uh, that can be helpful for like taking a look at, okay, it's a .csv, but is it really, CSV is a common format for comma separated values. It's a, as if you took a spreadsheet and in order to tell it where to sort of put the column breaks, you use a comma. So CSV is a really com common um, file extension for just a plain text file, but it's got commas where columns should go uh, for sort of inferring a spreadsheet-like for, uh, format. So it's got, um, yes, the viewer here, you can view, like, double check the format of your um, files. Um, I've got this one called .csv. I can see, yes, indeed, it's got uh, data such that, and let me actually broaden this out, and you can kind of see that it's got sort of rows and columns. The columns are separated by these commas, and the first row is a bunch of names. So that's that scenario is uh, called when the um, data file has a header. So if I were to use the... Uh, if I knew that I had a CSV file and it had a header, I could use the read underscore CSV function and that will read in the data. I'll actually pull up the help on read CSV. So if I open up read CSV, the help, it actually opens up the help for read.delim. Um, that's because read.csv is just sort of a special case of read.delim. Read.csv um, assumes that there's comma-separated uh, values, uh, whereas read.delim, you have to tell it what uh, characters uh, specifies the comma separation. So that's why you get that read.delim coming up as the um, main help page. But looking at read.csv, um, call names equals true. So that uh, means that there's a header there. Um, and later on, I guess, it doesn't even have a 
argument t talking about what the um, separation value is because it's we've explicitly by re using read underscore CSV we're saying it's a comma separated value. So if I run this and I look at the output, so what I'm doing is I'm calling read.csv. Um, oh, I should also walk through the arguments that I'm giving it here. So read.csv takes as its first argument, um, the first named argument is file. So presumably it's asking for the name of a file. Um, but I've given it this weird syntax. So this is the file name that I wanted, ant underscore subnum1. But I've given it this weird syntax where I have a dot dot slash data slash and then the name. Anybody want to make a guess why? So it's, yeah, it's in the data folder. And what does the dot dot mean? Yeah. So it, it doesn't jump two up, it just jumps up. Um, it, there's two dots because dot means this folder. Um, it's, you can actually leave off the dot if you want to refer to this folder as well. It's a little bit of a confusing, con or confusing um, redundancy there. But dot dot means go up one. So again, R is currently looking in the analysis folder. So dot dot means go up one, and then slash data means once you're up one, go down into a folder called data, and then the final slash means now I'm going to give you the name of a file to um, give you. So it actually reads it kind of backwards. It says, okay, look for a file named ant subnum one dot csv. This slash kind of means in a folder named data in the parent of the current directory. So that's going to read uh, the file and create a tibble and assign it into an object that I've arbitrarily named D1 right here. When that runs, it's going to give me a little bit of a sort of message about what it found in that file. So that's what this printout is, parsed with column specification. Well, it's showing me that it's found one, two, three, four, five, six, seven columns. And it's telling me what it thinks it found in that column. So it's saying in this column subnum, it found an integer. In block, it found integer. In trial, it found integer. In the Q column, it found character. In blank column, it found character. In RT, it found double. In error, it found integer. So let's actually look at that file again. Um, bu -bu -bu. I'll make it big. So if we actually look at the values, it's in this column, it's like ones, well, it's actually going to be all ones. Um, in the next column, it's all numbers too. The next column has quotes around it, but it's uh, actually, if, so that's the subnum, it's all ones, in block, it's all ones, and then it comes two and three, etc. cetera. Um, for trial, this column has numbers, but each number is surrounded by quotes. Uh, read CSV is smart enough to see that if all we have is numbers, but it's in quotes, it automatically has turned it into a number. Um, Q, though, the column, the next entry, which is in the Q column, it's seeing that there's not only quotes, but it's actually characters on the inside. So it's left that as characters. Ditto with the flank column, it's treated that as characters. With the RT column, it has um, seen that it's a big long number. Well, it's a number with a decimal, so it has um, it's treating it as a number. It's a kind of special number that's a little bit different from integer. Um, you don't need to worry about the difference between integer and double for most of what you do in R. Um, and finally, for the last column, it will see that it's ones and zeros. And so it will call it a number, an integer. Um, I haven't told you anything about this data set yet. Um, I can tell you, though, that these are kind of the expected values that you would get out of, um, or that I, that it's good that it called these ones numbers and these one characters and this one a double, et cetera.
um, for sorry. Okay. Okay. So, yep. Yes, it does. So that's going to change what uh, file uh, sort of reader you use. So this is read.csv. It's created this CSV. Um, we can see the original file here. If we actually look at D1, uh, reader is will spit out a tibble. So we can see some sort of summary info about the uh, table that it created. Um, but I actually have some other files in this directory. Here's a CSV. What about this TXT? Well, I'll click it and that opens it down in here in the source pane. I'm just looking at the, it's treating it just as a raw text file. So this is actually the exact same data, the exact same file, except that I've, instead of comma separated values, it's tab separated values. So that's actually also a fairly common um, format for data. Um, what's nice is with tab separate values, if you copy and paste this right into a spreadsheet, it automatically sort of will paste into a nice, into the columns and everything. Um, I think these days CSV, if you did a copy of this and paste it into a spreadsheet, it would recognize the commas and do it properly. But um, there once was a time when that only worked for tab separated values, so tab separated files are fairly popular. They're also nicer to look at than the CSV. Um, it's easier to see the tabs. Um, so in the same way that I've got read.csv, I'll copy this and I'll have an example of using read TSV. If you look in the help again for read CSV, there's also entries for read TSV. And I think up at the top it says that um, read CSV and read TSV are special cases of the general read.delim. They're useful for the most common types of flat file data, comma separated values, and tab separated values respectively. So read.tsv is for tab separated values. I do, yeah. So if I wanted to read that txt file with read.tsv, I would need to give it the right name. So, and I'll put this in something called d2. And you get sort of the same similar output here because it's the exact same data. Um, and if I say print d2, it's going to be the same thing. Um, yeah, yep, yep. So here's like just a quick summary of the data. If I do view with vi, here, I'll put it over here. Um, view capital V. That will open up another tab in this area, and it looks kind of like a spreadsheet. Now, you can't actually modify the values here. You can sort by them, actually, I think. Yeah, but you can't modify. I wonder how you unsort. You can also. Oh, oh, that puts. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you could just close it and then do view two d two again, and it's back to its original sorting. Um, and you can do filtering. I don't. Does that actually change the data? I don't think it. It changes the what's shown, but it doesn't change the underlying d two data. So this is again sort of a read only view of the data. You can't actually. So, yeah, it's useful for sort of doing some visual stuff on your data, or visual assessment of the data. So, these are scenarios where I had a couple files. This one, it was a CSV, and I checked, and I could tell that it was a CSV. 
so I could I knew to use the read read underscore CSV. Um, this other one I knew was tab separated, so I knew to use read underscore TSV. Um, what if you don't really know what the file is? Um, a useful tool is, um, and now this isn't in your most what most people have for R Studio. If you Google R Studio um, and then put preview, and you get to a secret page that these are um, sort of pre-releases of our studio and it just so happens that the current pre-release has this really neat feature um, the pre-releases I mean in theory a pre-release is not as stable it might have a few bugs in it um, but my experience thus far is that I've never experienced a bug um, with these previews so I only it only means that you get these extra features early so one of the features that is in the current version is a really nice import wizard, um, a nice sort of window that you can use to uh, figure out what code you should write here for reading in data. So what do I mean by that? Okay, so I'm gonna go up to our studio, and again, this is the preview version. So if you happen to have the preview version, you'll get you'll see a little import data set sort of toggle here. And your, your options are from Excel, from SPSS. So it's nice, it actually has sort of little options for all the uh, more popular data formats. We'll just do CSV for now. And even though maybe I'm not even interested in a file that's a CSV, maybe I'm interested in a file that says .txt. So um, opening this read import CSV uh, window will uh, allow you to read in that or allow you to figure out how to read in that um, file. So you can browse to where the file is on your computer. I'm a little annoyed that the browse window doesn't automatically open in the current working directory. Um, that I guess is a bit of a bug. Um, so you could just navigate to where your current working directory is. Um, I'm lazy, I don't wanna do that. I do know though that if I click cancel and I just copy the string that's associated with the file that I would otherwise type in here, it's gonna work, I can paste that in that area. So I'll go import data set from CSV and I'll just paste that in there. And if you click the update button now, having paste in that, um, string, it will try to read things in. So first of all, it says, does this exist? Yes, but this worked the other day. <laughs> so give me a second. Maybe I don't need the quotes. Update. Yes. Okay. So I'm asking it to look at this .txt file. This is the import CSV window. So by default, it has assumed that I am looking at a comma delimited file, but it's not. It's a tab delimited file. Not to worry, I can, there's a little checkbox here. I can say delimiter is a tab. And it's automatically update to show me what it would get. No, it might be something really wonky. Um, so this gives you the option to sort of visually see what's the, um, if you attempt to put it as comma separated or semicolon separated or just any white space separated. Um, sorry? Yeah. Whatever turns it into a table, that's the one that works for it. Usually most formats are one of these four. That's why they're the, they're the options that are available for. If you've got a weird one, um, you'll have to, yeah, you'll have to explicit, you'll, you'd use read.delim um, and you'd 
specify whatever the um, sort of uh, weird character that specifies the different commas um, as an argument to read dot delim. Uh, under files, uh, file import data set, oh, okay. but again, only if you have the preview version of our studio. So you'll have to go Google our studio preview, first page that comes up, download it from there, um, and uh, that will give you this new feature that they haven't yet put in the main version. Yep. I don't. I, I think the installer will automatically delete the old one. So you can. There's a number of other things. So let's say we actually didn't have a file with the names up at the top. Um, the default for this is that it expects that that first row has the names of the columns. But if we didn't have names there. We could uncheck that box and it would put in fake names for each of those things. Um, now we actually happen to have names for those uh, columns there in this data set, so we want this to be checked. But you can actually see like it's actually creating the code to do a reading of this data file to produce whatever we see here. Um, it's showing the code right here. So you can see what the consequence of having sort of that checked versus not. It, that changes this call names argument. Call names equals false if that's unchecked. And if it's checked, um, that call names argument has disappeared, kind of implying that the default is that call names equals true. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because this actually is a data set where there's um, an entry. So it will, if you actually do have a header there, but you don't have this checked, it's going to see that header row, think it's data, and see that it's a character. And so, um, let's see. There's other scenarios where, um, so this. Data file actually has a couple NAs in the first entries here. Um, there might be NAs elsewhere, no. Um, and it's literally the string N, capital N, capital A. So that's something that R automatically knows how to deal with. Um, if you had something, a piece of software that maybe put some other different string, you can specify, you can tell R that that's, uh, whatever that string is, means NA. Uh, so, in this sort of import wizard, there's a box here where you can say what the NA should be. Um, maybe your software puts the word null wherever it's supposed to be NA, or wherever there's missing data. Um, if you see, by clicking in this little viewer here, null, it has changed the code to say NA equals null. So that sort of implies that there's an argument to read underscore delim called NA, and that there's also an argument to read CSV called NA, and an argument to read TSV called NA that is um, specifying the uh, strings that it will then, if it encounters it in any column, it will then convert to an NA. So, um, There's even an uh, option that if it encounters an empty string, put that as NA. I have no idea what. Let's see. That almost like an overheating thing. It got too excited with all this. Sorry? Yeah. I wonder. Yeah. 
question is a silly question, but how do you get from an Excel file to a CSV or a so if you noticed in that import wizard, there was a import Excel. Yeah. So um, I don't know. Does it actually did anybody with the non preview version? So you just updated. Uh, but I couldn't. I have to save it as a CSV. And you can do that from Excel. Yeah, Excel has good ex export functions anyway. Um, yeah, um, but. Excel is, oh, where we go? I actually think that's, yeah, the, um, that got too hot. All right. Um, so whenever you figure out, if, if you're able to figure out sort of a set of boxes to check and options to select here that creates the data that um, you want to actually import, you can then copy that code and then just use that Actually, there's a little button here to copy all that code. And you can either hit import or cancel and just paste it in. And that's, you can actually see the, uh, the code that is required to read that specific data set. So if you go through the point and click, you could point and click and do that every time. So I'll go through, tell it, oh. I have to tell it what file it was again. But best thing, thing to do is if you've got a tough data file, do that once, but copy the code that it produces, and then just have that code ready in your um, script to run anytime you want to run it again, rather than having to go through point and click again. You can't. Well, you actually can just go browse for it. So, wherever it is, wherever it lives. Uh, I think I had a workshop files. Nope, that's a movie. Wow, that's gonna. So, I could do it through that whole laborious process. Find it and say tabs limited. Um, but yeah, I was being lazy and I just typed the alternative, which is dot dot slash, because I knew that it's in the par go in the data directory that's in the parent directory. To go up twice, you'd want that. Yeah. Um. All right, so it's reading in data for you guys is probably going to be relatively simple for um, the, at least the purposes of this course, because usually you'll be finding sort of a pre-made data set that um, somebody has already released online, and usually those are pretty clean and easy to read in, um, and they'll be one of these sort of standard formats. Um, I just wanted to show you sort of, well, if you encounter issues, we'll maybe go, I'll get you to tell me about them and we'll go through specific cases as uh, we encounter them. Um, but in general, that little import wizard is a good way to figure out what sort of arguments you might need for these read.delim or read underscore delim, read underscore CSV, read underscore TSV. Um, I haven't explored the import Excel um, or any of the other ones, but um, I presume they work fairly well. Um, you guys explore them and report back to me. Uh, I just wanted to also show you if you had a scenario where you had lots of data files and you needed to read them all in sequentially, it's probably not so much going to be what you guys encounter. Um, I do a lot of experiments where I have individual people coming in, they do something on a computer and then they leave, so each person leaves behind a file for them for their session. Um, sometimes the same person might even come in multiple times and there's multiple files per person. So usually I at least have multiple files, one file for each person that came in and did my experiment. Um, this is what all these .txt files are all about. Um, so 
I could go in and there's 20 of them. So I could create d1 equals and uh, the read underscore tsv and put subject one there and then do the same d2 and d3 and d4. But that's a lot of typing. I don't want to. And then I'd have to figure out some way of combining those together at the end. I don't want to have to type in every single person's file name. So there's two stages to this. One is getting a list of the files that you want to read in. And the second is reading them all in. So the first stage, getting a list of files. Well, there's a function called list.files. If you... Um, that function has three sort of critical uh, arguments to it. So list.files will take a first argument called path, and that's where it should look for files. So we've already encountered this dot dot sort of syntax here. We're, gi we're giving it a string, and we're saying go up to the parent directory and then down in a directory called data. So that's where it's going to look for files. Um, the next argument is, call, is called pattern, and we're giving it a string corresponding to a sequence of characters that um, we want it to match. So if you give it, if you don't give it this argument, so I'll, if I commented that out, it would list all the files that it finds at the location that you've given it. But maybe we've got some other files in there. For example, I've got this CSV in there that's just a redundant sort of data file. I don't want that one to be included. So a general good sort of practice is to find something that's sort of common across all your um, files that you want um, and put it as the value to the pattern argument. Yeah, it doesn't need to be the extension. Um, that's the only thing that's unique in this case, because this one, the, the only thing that differs between this and the others is the extension. But yeah, yep, 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 exactly. Um, and this last bit, full names equals true, is um, a little bit, actually, let me do a quick look. Remember, sorry. Is there a path argument to files? Uh, no. Okay. This full name is equals true. Well, let's figure out what it is. Let's first of all, I'm going to comment out that line. And so it's going to read in the data. Sorry, it's going to run this function called list.files. This function is going to look at this location and find all the files that match this pattern, that have a, sort of a string in them somewhere that matches this pattern. It's going to take that list of files and store them away into an object called files to read. Um, and now I'm going to just, and I'm also going to print it out at the end. So if I run that, and this is the list of all the files that I wanted it to read in. How are we doing for time? Okay, I'll go quick. I'll skip the last thing. So that's a list. That's just a list of strings. Um, I'm going to pass each of these values on to read.tsv um, or whatever reading function I have already decided is useful for the, whatever data set that I have or data type that I have. Um, but I actually happen to know that. Um, it read.tsv wants to know the full path. This is just the file name, but read.tsv wants like the full path of where to go. So it, in the same way that I've told list.files that it needs to go up one and down into data, read.tsv will want to know that it needs to go up one and down into data to find each of these. Um, a trick to do that is to use the full.names equals true. Well, use the full.names argument to list.files and set its value to true. And what that's going to do is it's going to append this path to the beginning of everything that it finds.
So I'll show you what that looks like. Now, each of these file names has that dot dot slash data slash at the beginning. So now this is a string that read.csv is going to be able to, or TSV, is going to be able to use to find this data set. So having created this thing called files to read, which is just a character vector, um, a list of strings, um, I can then use it along with this function called mapdf. Mapdf comes from the per package, and all it does is it takes a first argument called dot x. Don't ask me why they have the dot x versus just x. It, um, a first argument called dot x, and as its value, we're giving it the list of um, things that we want to read. And it takes as a second argument, dot f. It's expecting us to give it a function, a reading function. So I'm, I'm going to take this off for now. So what's going to happen here? Mapdf internally will take for each element it finds in this list, it's going to run this function passing that element as the value for the first argument in this function. So this is a reading thing, so it's expecting a file name. So the first file it finds, the first file name it finds here, this first string, is going to be supplied as the first argument to read.tsv. That's going to return a data set. It's going to put that off to the side. It's going to look at files to read for the second element. It's going to supply that as the first argument to read.tsv, that's going to yield a data set. It's going to put that to the side. It's going to repeat through each of the items in the um, files to read list, using each one as the files argument for read, read underscore tsv, yielding a data set for each. And at the very end, it's going to combine all of them together. So you have one thing that is the data set reflecting sort of the combination of all these individual data sets that you read in. So since we're using read underscore TSV, every time it has read in a new data file, so for every item in this list, um, it spits out this its little summary of what it found. So we'll have 20 of those summaries. Um, I don't know if there's like a quiet Sometimes functions will have an argument called quiet, in which case they refrain from giving you any sort of output messages, um, but you can just ignore these. Um, I mean, you can check to see if there were any actual warnings that happened, but if you were to scroll through these, they'd all look the exact, they all come up with the exact same sort of message, because um, all those files I happen to know were structured the same. Um, so now that has created this object called D. We say print D. It's a table with those same columns that we saw before, but now it has far more rows because we've got a bunch of rows for each of 20 people. So 288 times 20. Um, we could double check that we've actually um, Let's actually just see how many, oh, I've actually got a little bit down here. Uh, show the count of rows per file. So how many rows did we get for each individual person? Uh, oh, this uses a little bit that I want to skip because we're running out of time. But just showing you, if I want to say group by this column subnum, which I happen to know encodes like what each person's, there was only one person per file. Um, and so that's the subnum column. Uh, the first file had a one in that column, the second file had a two in that column, etc. So if I just wanted to make sure that I got data associated with each of these, oh, I didn't load plier. We can run this. <sighs> function, could not function group by. Oh, yes, dplyr. 
Plier is a package that actually exists. It's by the same author, and it existed before dplyr, so I get a little confused. So we can see now that each file has been read in through 1 through 20, and each file has had 288 entries in it, rows. All right, I'm going to cut it off there. Um, we'll Thursday start talking about... Um, that's <laughs> actual... <laughs>